and may Allah make us among his companions and his helpers and supporters with the barakah of salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا غريب كربلاء يا رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم وشفاعتكم في الدنيا والآخرة أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Our discussion tonight inshallah will be about mental health. This issue is of extreme significance as scientists are finding that it is on the rise. Now the reason for the rise could be because more and more people are experiencing some mental health issues. Or it may be because more people are now reporting mental health problems. Or it could be because now we have better documentation of mental health problems. Regardless, mental health is a serious concern in this day and age. I will quote to you what the World Health Organization talks about mental health only in Europe and then in some aspects globally. Here is what they say in the World Health Organization data. They say, according to systematic review of data and statistics from community studies in European Union countries, Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland, 27% of the adult population, here defined as age 18 to 65, had experienced at least one of a series of mental disorders in the past year. This included problems arising from substance abuse, 
psychosis, depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. They continue to say, these figures represent an enormous human toll of ill health with an estimated, listen to the number, 83 million people being affected. That is almost equivalent to the population of the UK. Imagine the entire population of the United Kingdom being affected with mental health problems. That's a huge number. Then they continue on to say some very interesting data, but also very scary data. Mental disorders are by far, they say, the largest contributor to chronic conditions afflicting the population of Europe. Chronic conditions, chronic disorders. It is by far the largest contributor. According to the most recent available data from 2012, neuropsychiatric disorders rank as the first cause of years lived with disability in Europe. People who have mental health problems, that's the leading cause of years lived with a disability. It means people just are dis unable to work, they have a problem. Now you can imagine the consequence of this on the financial aspect. When they are unable to work, they are not able to contribute and of course governments look at that from a financial perspective it means we have to support them it means they have to go see health practitioners physicians doctors etc and all that would add on the financial toll of the countries then they come to suicide because if these persist sometimes they can progress to god forbid suicide listen to the number they say an estimated 804,000 deaths occurred worldwide in 2012 because of suicide. When you divide that number by the number of minutes in the year, 800,000, 804,000 divided by the number of minutes every year, this means every 40 seconds, someone is committing suicide in the world. Think about it. By the end of our majlis today, think how many people on average would have committed suicide. These numbers are very scary. And they affect everybody. They say, Suicide accounts for 17.6 of all death among young adults aged 15 to 29 in high-income countries, even high-income countries. In high-income countries, 3.5 males commit suicide for every female. So more men, more men commit suicide than women. However, more women suffer from mental health than men. That's what the data suggests. So more women experience mental health problems than men. However, more men ending up committing suicide than women. In total, 804,000 in 2012. And I saw a similar figure by the World Health Organization for 2016. More or less the same. Again, about 800,000 people. So these statistics are quite important. They affect all walks of life. Recently, in the past year, some of you may be familiar with a very famous chef who worked for the CNN. He was a celebrity chef, as they call him. He committed suicide. Another lady who is a very successful fashion designer in New York, she committed suicide. So because they were high profile cases, they were all over the news. And experts, medical experts were saying, this shows that mental health affects everyone, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are famous or not famous, it runs across. So this is a very serious problem that needs to be dealt with. 
in the Muslim community, we are not immune from this. Many Muslims also suffer from mental health problems. Many Muslims, unfortunately, sometimes commit suicide, unfortunately. So the question is that we need to deal with what is happening? Why do people experience mental health problems? That's one. Second, how can we solve it? What are some of the solutions? Of course, a disclaimer here. As I mentioned last night in a one-hour lecture, you cannot solve the problem of mental health. Second, I want also to make it very clear from where the get-go. Whatever solutions we will be presenting, some of them are scientific, backed up by science. Some of them are religious-based. And sometimes they meet the scientific recommendations, have also a religious analogy to it. I will make it clear, inshallah. By all means, we are not saying, and I repeat, we are not suggesting here in this lecture that we just use these recommendations and do not seek medical intervention. If medical intervention is necessary, it's required, then we need to seek medical intervention. If the physician recommends some medications, then we need to work with the physicians to really figure out what is the best option for us. And hence, please do not say that Sheikh here is giving us a beautiful therapy and he's saying we should not get any medical therapy or medical guidance or medical... That's not exactly what we're saying. What we are trying to say here in this lecture is sometimes people start off by feeling down, feeling depressed which is different from depression. We all experience the highs and the lows in life. You know, things sometimes don't work out, so you go in, in a downturn. People experience this. Now, if this downturn persists, insists, this may develop progress to something more serious. Now, and instead of just being depressed, a person falls into depression. A person gets into anxiety, anxiety disorders. A person might even progress and develop, God forbid, bipolar, schizophrenia, etc., etc. People sometimes resort to substance abuse. Sometimes people resort to self-harm. What we will try to say is those who fall in the state of just being depressed, you know, at the beginning, maybe if they practice some of what the recommendation that scientists and some of the Quran or the Ruayat, what they suggest, Maybe they can work their way out of feeling depressed. And hence, inshallah, that will help them. But if it does consist, you know, become consistent and things pursue for further, then medical guidance, medical counseling need to be sought. Medical guidance. So this is from the beginning. What are the reasons for mental health problems? There are many, many problems. We will discuss a few of them. One of the reasons for mental health problems is trauma. People sometimes experience a trauma. This trauma could also be variable. A trauma could be a loss of a loved one. Someone loses a loved one. A few years ago, here in Britain, there is a very famous fashion designer in Britain, a man. He used to design fashion for celebrities. His mother passed away. He wrote a suicide note that I cannot keep with my life after my mother. I really loved my mother. And hence he committed suicide shortly after the death of his mother. That was something that he couldn't cope with. That was a trauma that he experienced that he couldn't deal with. Trauma could be a financial loss. Someone has a good job, was doing well. For example, think of the 2008 financial crisis. You had individuals who, mashallah, were doing really well. Business is going really well. They're financially affluent. But all of a sudden, with the crash of the markets, things just turned around. Financially, they start getting into debt, getting into problems. That could be a trauma that some people just can't cope with. They become depressed. And then that depressed 
state progresses to depression and God forbid other problems. At that time, I remember reading in the papers, a 72 year old German man, 72 year old German man, billionaire, he committed suicide because he lost so much in the stocks market because of the 2008 financial crisis. He couldn't deal with that trauma. It was just too stressful for him. He committed suicide. So these trauma could be different. But trauma is a reason for mental health problems. People become depressed and unfortunately this may progress. So that's one reason. Second reason that is suggested, stress. People continuously live a stressful life. And that might develop some anxiety. Even youth, they say anxiety because of homework, because of grades. It causes depression in some youth. They're worried, my gosh, you know, I, I can't get the grades that I need to get into university. My dreams are shattered. They're so anxious. They develop anxiety disorders. Stress. People sometimes work so hard, day and night, night and day. They become sleep deprived. That sleep deprivation can result into mental health problems. People become stressed. They start losing sleep. They develop insomnia. So that creates a problem. So stress is another factor. Third reason is loneliness. People feeling lonely. They feel I am not appreciated. I am not loved. Here, women are more than men in terms of feeling that I am not good looking enough. I mentioned last night, Shelley Grabe in her paper in 2008, she states 50% of girls and undergraduate women suffer in the United States from psychological and physical problems because of the looks. They feel that I am not pretty enough. She looks in the mirror and she says, my gosh, I am not as pretty as these models out there. I am not beautiful enough. I may be overweight. And then what adds to the problem, my brothers and sisters, is sometimes a person comes to see this individual who is constantly thinking about this, that I am not pretty enough. I am overweight and says, oh, mashallah, you have gained some weight. Now, what do you think has just happened to this individual? She starts to go, she goes home and maybe she starts crying. She gets depressed that I am fat. I'm overweight when in fact she is not overweight. She could be beautiful, but because of that perception of the media that this is how the looks are. People sometimes develop low self-esteem that I am not good. Whatever I do, I'm a failure. Nobody likes me. No one wants to be with me. They develop this kind of loneliness. I don't want to be associated with people. Let's go to the Husseiniya. There is some program happening. Osama al-Attar is giving a lecture about mental health. No, sorry. I don't want to listen to Osama al-Attar. He depresses me even more. You know. One day someone wrote to me and said, Sheikh, no, mashallah, you make us laugh and you make us cry. I said, this is the attribute of Allah. Ya man adhaka wa abka. So, I don't want to be. Why? Because he or she says, I don't want to see people. I don't want to be around people. You know, people will ask me some questions. I don't want to be with people. That develops that loneliness. That loneliness. So loneliness is another factor. One factor is trauma. Another factor is stress. A third factor is loneliness. A fourth factor is expectations. What do we mean by this? Setting expectations. Let's say, for example, a person, smart, mashallah, he's getting good grades in, in, in high school, and he sets expectations. He says, you know what, inshallah, I'm going to go to university, I'm going to study engineering, and when I graduate, I'm going to do very well. I'm going to open up my, country, my uh, company. And inshallah, my company will become one of the best companies of engineering. Inshallah. So they set expectations, standards, 
ambitions, which is great, good stuff, good. But then, for example, say they go to first year university, and let's say, for example, God forbid, God forbid, something happens, and his or her father falls ill. His father falls ill to the point where the father cannot support the family anymore. He has to drop out of university and go work. Now, this individual, he might feel as a failure. You know, his expectations were, this is my dreams. My dream was to succeed. And maybe he had the ability, he had the potential. He is a smart person. But, subhanAllah, what they call it, life gets in the way. She has an expectation. This is what I would like. And sometimes these expectations could not be as ambitious. They could be simple expectations. Simple expectations. A person, for example, says, I, you know, on the weekend, by the weekend, I will finish reading this chapter. And doesn't get to finish reading the chapter. Something's very simple. But yet, says, you know, a person starts to think that, my gosh, every time I set up an expectation, something happens. And just, I never meet, I'm a failure. I can never meet my expectations. I can never develop, reach my goals. And even though these goals are so simple, they're simple goals. I'm, I mean, reading a chapter. I can't even read a chapter. Or something along these lines. So then, what's the point of me setting any goals anymore? Khalas, people start falling down, feeling down. So meeting these expectations sometimes. These are among the reasons. And I already mentioned financial problems under the trauma section. Sometimes they say financial problems. Trauma could also mean, God forbid, a divorce. A person experiences a divorce. It shatters their life. For the man or the woman. For example, the man would say, my God, my, the love of my life is gone. That's it. My whole life has crumbled. I can't see my children anymore because of the divorce, for example. Some problems happen. It just shatters the person. It makes them fall in a state of depression. So they became depressed and خلص. they just don't want to do anything anymore. So there are many reasons for mental health problems, as you can see. It's very multifaceted. And some do say that there is, could be a genetic aspect to it. There could be an environmental aspect to it. Food, the food you eat may affect the mood, your mood. So there are many, many issues here that deal with mental health. Okay. We'll suffice with these issues. Stress, trauma, which includes the loss of financial losses, loss of a loved one, uh, family problems. That all could be traumatic issues. A divorce, God forbid, impact of the divorce on the children. You know, sometimes children are traumatized by the divorce. But they're too young to express their feelings. When the children see the husband, the wife are fighting, the mom and dad are always fighting, they get traumatized. They get traumatized. But they're too young to express it. When they grow older, they start to develop some of these problems, anxieties, issues, etc., etc. Stress is a problem which may lead to lack of sleep, insomnias. That could lead to further problems. Loneliness is a problem. Loss of health could be a problem. Somebody loses his health or her health, God forbid. And they start feeling depressed. So there are many, many issues here. Okay, how do we deal with that? And that takes us to the next point of our discussion. How do we deal when we don't meet our expectations? When we feel that we are down? What can we do? Here, we have some points that stem from research. Others come from the Ahadith and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam The Quran and the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Some of those points, as I mentioned earlier, they cross. One thing, my brothers and sisters, we need to overcome the stigma of mental health. There is a stigma associated with mental health. It is all right for a person, if he or she feels depressed, to seek a psychologist. Go see a psychologist. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have a stigma associated. Does that mean I'm crazy? No. Just because you're seeing a psychologist doesn't mean you're crazy. People sometimes think that way. You know, 
you suggest to someone, why don't you go see a psychologist? So, well, are you suggesting I'm crazy? No, أخي. I know of a psychologist who sees a psychologist because of all the problems that the psychologist deals with counseling, problems, troubles, youth issues. So this psychologist tells me on a weekly basis, I have to go see a psychologist for therapy, just to vent. I need to vent off from all the problems I see in this world and the things that come across me. Just, so this is perfectly fine. One should not be feeling bad for seeing a psychologist. Overcome that stigma. Second, you don't have to announce to the world, I'm seeing a psychologist. Publish it on your social media and whatever. Talking a selfie with the psychologist and say, look at me. You don't have to do this. For confidentiality, you can keep everything confidential. Nobody has to know. My recommendation though, is to seek a psychologist who understands religious and cultural issues. Someone who understands your religious background, your cultural background. So he or she can have a better sense of what to say. A friend of mine who's a neurologist, not a psychologist or psychiatrist, he says, one day I brought a friend of mine who is in the medical profession on the day of Ashura, I brought him to the majlis. Now imagine bringing someone who's never been to a majlis before. He's not a Muslim and he comes to the majlis on the day of Ashura. He sat down, this person, and he was a physician as well. He looked at those people. The maqtal is being recited. Everyone is weeping, crying, and whatever. You know, people are like, Ah, Hussein, and all. An hour later, they serve food. Al Qima is there, mashallah. Qima comes. And look at you. I mentioned Qima and you're smiling. Haji Nuri, inshallah, you have Qima for us tonight? Inshallah, huh? Where? Shirat Haji Nuri. Sama Qima Shirat. He says, an hour later, they serve the food and everyone is sitting down here. Yeah, how are you, Mother? This guy, he looked at me in the face. He said, this is a textbook definition of manic disorder. Just, this is the textbook definition of it. These people are not, they have all bipolar problems. They are, they're all mentally ill. Just now they were crying, Ya Hussein, and you know, beating themselves and yeah, whatever. And now they're all laughing and joking and whatever. He says, that's classical. Yani imagine you go see a, psychi a psychologist like this man. He will definitely say you have mental problems. So it's good to go to someone who understands religious values. Comes from religious understanding, cultural understanding, understands your culture. That in your culture there are these exercises, these, these things which are normal. These are norms in the culture, for example. So that's what is good to do. If you can find a psychologist with this kind of a background. And we need to clarify something, brothers and sisters, because sometimes when I tell people, go see such a psychologist, like someone who has a bit similar background as you have, people get worried. He said, no, if I go see her, or if I go see him, no, the, the word will be all over the community. Everyone will know I have a problem. They are not allowed to do so. They are not allowed. If, if this psychologist you're seeing goes and tells people, oh, do you know, today Sheikh Osama came to see me. Sheikh Osama is cuckoo. Shway, 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 shway. Don't, don't. They will lose their license. This person will lose his, his or her license. What you need to understand, they have to act within the professional boundaries. It's like seeing a physician, a physical, a medical doctor. Whether he is from the community, not from the community, he is not allowed to speak about you. He, he can't even say that today so-and-so came to my practice and, you know, they are bound. In fact, some, you know, some hospitals, when you go to them, they will have posters in the elevators, on the staircases, that 
remind the, the doctors that remember patient confidentiality. When you are in the elevator, this is not the place to discuss patient problems because there could be someone else who's listening. When you're on the staircase, this is not the place to discuss patient problems. That behind closed doors, you have to be reminded of the patient confidentiality. So this is something we need to remember. So if needed to seek psychological help, go seek psychological help and don't worry. This is something that we need to think about. That's one. Second, what can we do if I am not yet at the stage where I may need a psychological help? I'm just feeling down. I feel down. What are some of the things that we can do? First, thinking positive. What does that mean? Every day, write down one thing positive about yourself. Think positive. Some people have low self-esteem. They think, I am not liked. I am not wanted. I am a loser. You know, whatever I do, I'm such a loser. And instead of thinking like this, saying, okay, I did not get this job interview, but it does not mean that I can't try next time and I can get the job next time. Now you're looking at it in a positive sense. Every day, say something good about yourself. In fact, I have a friend, or one day in Hajj, in Hajj, one of the people with us was a psychiatrist. I asked him, I said, do you do any marriage counseling? He says, yes, we do. I told him, what are some of the things that you give for marriage counseling? He says, one of the most effective ways is positive thinking. I said, what does that mean? What do you do? What do you tell the husband or the wife? He says, two things. First, every day, write something positive about your wife or your husband. Recently, I went to attend to one of these issues, marriage issues. And the husband said, interestingly, my wife is a great mother, but she's a terrible wife. I said, hold on a second. That is a very interesting statement, and it is an oxymoron. He says, what do you mean? I said, you just said your wife is a great mother. He said, yes. I said, okay, so when you go to work, do you have to worry about your children who's looking after them, who's going to be taking care of them. He said, no, my wife is a great mother. Okay, good. When you travel to Hajj, Umrah, Ziyarah, when you are in Hajj, in Umrah, in Ziyarah, do you have to constantly think, imagine if you are in Hajj and you're constantly thinking about your children, how are they, how is their well-being, are they okay, are they sleeping well, are they, imagine what is your Hajj going to be like? What is your ziyara going to be? If you're constantly thinking like this, are you going to enjoy that ziyara? Whereas you go to hajj, go to umrah, go to ziyara, and you don't have to worry about this. Is that true? He looks at me and he says, yes, that's true. She's a great mother. I said, that means she's a great wife. If she is taking care of your children to the point where you go to work, you don't have to worry about your children. You can concentrate and focus on your work. You go for Hajj, you go to Ziyara, you go to Umrah, you go to wherever. You don't have to worry. You can actually concentrate and enjoy your Hajj, enjoy your Umrah, enjoy your Ziyara. Doesn't that mean she's a good wife? Looked at me and said, I never thought about it that way. I said, oh, there you go. This is positive thinking. Think about the positives. All right. You have set certain expectations. I want my wife to do this, 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 this. Okay, well, maybe your expectations are not realistic expectations. When she has children to look after, when she has, for example, other issues to deal with, she can't meet all these expectations of yours. So let's work something out. Alhamdulillah, a little while later, the wife sends me a message, says, Alhamdulillah, he has improved significantly because he started thinking about the positive things of the wife. So these do matter. They do actually affect you psychologically. Think of the positive things that you have done. Don't say, I'm a loser. No, alhamdulillah. Mu'mineen. We are, especially who are the followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim We are 
people who inshallah will be with Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi in Jannah. Are we losers? No, Allah. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, كَيْفَ بِكُمْ إِذَا حُشِرْتُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَكَانَ عَلِي سَلَامُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ إِمَامُكُمْ أَيْنَ تَظُنُّونَ يَأْخُذُكُمْ أَوْ يَمْضِي بِكُمْ فقال سلام الله عليه هي الجنة والله الجنة والله الجنة والله اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد وعلي محمد هاي صلواتكم محيدرية اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد وعجل فرجه لا حتى هاي هم محيدرية اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد وعجل إيه هسا عدل شوية شوية يعني همنا حيدرية إلا ربع إمام الصادق says to some of his companions how about you people الشيعة on the day of judgment when you come to the محشر and you look at the banner of Imam Ali Imam Ali holding the banner and you go with him how would you feel then where do you think he's going to take you and Imam الصادق repeats it three times he said he's going to take you to Jannah 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 imagine are we losers? La wallah, we're not losers. Yes, things in dunya may be difficult, correct. I may not be the, the successful businessman. But I'm not a loser. I am successful. I am smart. I can do work. I can succeed. That's thinking positively. The second thing that psychiatrist told me, says I tell to these people, to the spouses, every day the husband has to tell his wife, I love you. And the wife has to tell the husband, I love you. I told him, doctor, that's just a lie. What if the wife prefers seeing Israel than seeing her husband? Then she's, I mean, she's, that's not, he, he's not being truthful to her. He says, actually, that's not true. He says, every day, if he continues to write one thing positive about her, and if every day he continues to say, I love you, I love you, I... eventually, psychologically, subconsciously, he's going to accept it. And he will start to appreciate her. And she will start to appreciate him. So that's thinking positive. Similarly about your own thing, yourself. Think positively about yourself. Learn to love yourself. Not by being selfish. I'm not saying being selfish. No, but rather instead of having low self-esteem, I'm a loser. I can't get anything done. They say there was a man in Bani Israel. He was what you call today a loser. Whatever he business, anything he does, subhanallah, everything collapses. And this guy, if you see him coming this way, you run away to another street because some disaster is going to happen. One of those people. And he lived an impoverished life. One day, his wife told him, okay, we're so, I mean, impoverished. So she knitted, she knitted a sweater. She knitted something. He said, she said, go, take this, sell it in the market, whatever you get for it, buy us some food, we're starving. He takes the sweater, goes around, no one wants to buy it. So what does he find? A fisherman by the sea. He, say, he, sees, he sees he has one fish that's old, old fish. He says, how about if I trade you? You give me this old fish, I'll give you the sweater. The guy looks at the knitted sweater. He's like, deal, here. He goes home. His wife says, what did you just do? What is this? I knitted this sweater. I worked really hard to do this sweater. And this is what you get us for? He says, yalla, khalas, ba'at fish. He says, inna lillah wa inna lihi raja. Okay, fine. So he starts to cleaning it when he cuts its stomach, he finds two gems inside the stomach of this fish. The wife says, Subhanallah, great, maybe our luck is turning. Take them and sell them. He goes, he sells them. He gets two bags of money, one for each. Comes home and says, Look, two bags of money. They have never seen money in their lives. He puts them on the table. The wife gets out to do something. Someone comes, knocks on the door. This man opens the door. Yes, how can I help you? I'm a poor person. Please help me. I don't have anything. He says, okay, you see these two bags of... Take one of them. 
The man comes, takes the bag and goes away with it. The wife comes back home. What does she do? I don't think they had garages back then. Car garages. So that he can sleep in it. But the wife was, why did you just this? All these years we're living in poverty. Now that Allah has given us some rizq, you give half of it away? What did you just do? He said, you know what? This poor man came. Alhamdulillah, we still have one more bag of alhamdulillah money. Khalas. A short while later, someone else knocks on the door. It's the same person, the same impoverished person. He says to the man, this is your bag of money. Take it. I am an angel from Allah. Allah wanted to test you. You did not have money. You were impoverished your whole life. Now that Allah gave you this rizq, what will you do with it? Will you help people? Will you look after people? And you did. When I came as an impoverished man, you gave me half of your money. So here, take it back and Allah sends you his salam and says, you will never experience poverty for the rest of your life. He took it and went. So you see, do you call this man a loser? No. He's a mu'min, a mu'min. He had the iman in Allah, the belief in Allah. Tawakkul ala Allah. That's a positive thinking. So always, brothers and sisters, think positively. If you, God forbid, experience these financial problems that we were talking about, like a trauma. No. Experience, khalas. Things go bad financially. Think positive. Say, okay, alhamdulillah, I still have my health. I still have my family. My family is here, alhamdulillah. None of my children are dead. None of my, you know, family. Alhamdulillah, we're good. Khalas. Money comes, money goes. Now you're thinking positively. I can put in effort now to change things. This is great. This is positive thinking. So this is something important, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. If you lose your health, say, Alhamdulillah, at least I have my family. There is a mu'min whom I visited. He's very ill, bedridden. But Alhamdulillah, the ni'mah of Allah upon this mu'min, he is surrounded by his family. He's surrounded. His son is looking after him. This man's wife is there to look after him. This is ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ni'mah. His health is not there. But his family is there. If you, God forbid, lose your health, lose your money, lose your family, it's like, what else is left, Sheikh? Your iman is there. Okay, dunya is difficult, but the akhirah, inshallah, will be there. Isa, alayhi salam, the prophet, says, Ya Rab, who is my neighbor in Jannah? Allah tells him, go to this place, you'll find your neighbor in Jannah. Isa, salamullahi alayhi, goes. He finds a place that is ruins. You know, crumbled place, ruins. He enters, he finds someone who is paralyzed, can't walk. Very old, blind, very poor. Yet he is praying, he's saying some words. Isa listens, this man is saying, Ya muhsinu, Ya mujmilu, Ya mun'am, Ya muhsin, Ya mujmil, Ya Mun'am. And he's repeating it. Isa alayhi salam. Ya Muhsin means, O oh one who is so kind. Mujmil, O oh one who is so beautiful and makes me beautiful. Mun'am, O oh the one who sends his blessings upon me. Isa alayhi salam told him, Ya Shaykh, old man, where is the blessings of Allah on you? Isa is trying to test him, to ask him. He knows, of course. But where is the blessings of Allah? You're saying, Muhsin, where is the kindness of Allah? You live in this ruin. This ruin. Look at the place you live. You don't have your health. You're paralyzed. You're blind. You're poor. Where is the blessings of Allah? Where? He says, Ya Ruh Allah. How did he recognize this is Ruh Allah? SubhanAllah, he's a blind man. But his heart is not blind. He smells the fragrance of Isa, salamullahi alayhi. He says, Ya Ruh Allah. Out of all Allah's creation, He chose me to take my health away. My legs, my eyes. Don't you think I'm special? 
out of all Allah's creation, Allah chose me to be poor. But out of all Allah's creation, he made me remember him and do his dhikr. So do you not feel that I am showered by Allah's blessings? Doesn't that tell you? I am showered. This is where the ayah that says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ala bi-dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find tranquility, peace. Positive thinking. Think about the positive things. And if nothing is there, think of your iman. Alhamdulillah, I have the iman. The love of Ahlul Bayt is in my heart. That is the greatest ni'mah. Okay, so that's one thing. Thinking positively, okay? That's one. Second, gratitude. What is gratitude? Some researchers, they went to a school. They divided the students into two groups. One group, they told them every day, just write something about your day, anything about your day. Okay? Today, for example, I had a lot of homework. Okay, write it down. What, anything about your day. The second half of the students, they told them, write down something positive. Something you are grateful for. Something you are thankful for. What are you grateful for? So they started writing down. After two weeks, they gave 10 $1 bills to each group. $1 bills. This is the United States. So $1 bills. Ten of them to each group. They said you can spend it in any way you like. You can spend it on yourself or you can give it to charity. You can give some of it to charity. You can keep all of it to yourself. Give it all to... It's up to you. Interestingly, what the researchers found is the group that wrote their gratitude journal every day for two weeks, they gave up two-thirds of their money for charity. And they kept only a third for themselves. The other group, the other group that did not write a gratitude journal, but wrote, wrote when something happens in their day, they kept two thirds of the money. Or more than half of the money, they kept it to themselves. They did not donate, not even half of what they had. They kept more than half to themselves and only donated a small portion. The conclusion they came with, the researchers, is that by writing every day something you are grateful for, you can improve your mental status. You can be happier. You can help others. You can become generous. So gratitude, they feel, can be taught. Gratitude, being grateful. And that is something important. What does the Quran say about gratitude? Wa in shakartum, huh? La azidannakum. If you are grateful, I will increase you. This increase is not necessarily financial increase. It's general. Allah can increase you financially. Allah can increase you psychologically. Increase you health-wise. Increase you, etc., etc. So therefore, being grateful, gratitude is something that is very important. That's the second thing that we need to practice. Gratitude, being grateful. The third thing. Do not be hung on to some experiences that may be negative that happened in the past. Some people just eat themselves alive. You know, I wish I did not do this. 10 years ago, had I not done that business transaction 10 years ago, things would have been completely different. Khalas ya akhi, get over it. That's it. Move on. Don't be held back by that thing. Okay, khalas, move on. They say, people who establish successful businesses, businesses that take off, it was not their first experience. It was not their second experience. It's usually the third experience. They started a business and it failed. Second time, it failed. Third time, things took off. What is the difference? What did they do though? They noticed that they sat down and they reflected. 
why did my business fail? What strategies did I use that made me fail? What happened? So they started writing the list down. Of course, that's on average. You have some individuals who, mashallah, they start a business and things take off. So there are others. But on average, it takes three tries. But they sit down and they think. They say, okay, next time, this is what I'm going to do. So they start working that way. So don't get hang on to things that happened in the past. Move on. Move on. This may also fall in our sharia, in the hadith, something about taghafal. What is taghafal? Taghafal is praised in a hadith of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. What is taghafal? Taghafal means don't be hung up on everything the people say. Someone said this word to me. I go back to the example I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Someone feels that, you know, someone comes and says, Oh, mashallah, you've gained weight. Khalas, okay. Well, gained weight, too bad. Okay, whatever. I know I'm beautiful. You can see. So what? Khalas. Someone comes into the majlis, says salam to everyone, doesn't say salam alaykum to me. Allahu Akbar. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. This is the greatest problem. Why did he not say salam alaykum to me? He disrespects me? I will never attend his wedding. So what? Khalas didn't say salam alaykum. Maybe he didn't see me. Even if he saw me. So what? If he had said salam alaykum or did not say salam alaykum, is this going to increase my status in Allah or decrease my status before Allah? Khalas, move on. Don't get hung on to all this. This is called taghafal. The other day I met a, a brother. He comes from a community, I won't mention which community, but this community, they really try to attend every single wedding that happens in the family. This friend of mine, or this individual I met, he says, Sheikh, you won't believe it. So I asked one day, I said, I said to these people, how do you manage to attend every single wedding? Some weddings happen in the east, in the west, in the north, in the south. How can you guys do all this? Say, Sheikh, what can we do? You know, this is something we have to do. People have expectations. Do you know something, Sheikh? I said, what? 18 years ago, there was a family wedding. I could not attend it. Do you know something? Believe it or not, until today, whenever the father of the groom sees me, he says, you did not attend my son's wedding. I said, so 18 years. I mean, the son has become a grandfather now. Maybe. Let go, man. Tell him, tell him, let go. Forget 18 years later. You did not attend my son's. Get over it. You have some people like this, subhanallah. And tip married couples never do that with your spouse. You sit down and you tell her, Do you remember 10 years ago when you cooked that terrible meal, but I ate it? You know, you remember 10 years ago? You know. I said, it's okay, I will get over it 10 years ago. And then she'll say, well, you know, Ahmed Rabbak. You, know, you remember 12 years ago when you forgot our anniversary? You know. Get over it. Khalas, move on. So this is something important. Don't hang up. This is taghafal. This is important. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, one who does not do taghafal. On many things, then he will not have a happy life. Subhanallah. You will have a terrible. Imagine if you get hung up on every word. Every day you'll come home and feeling miserable. And then you'll make everyone's life miserable. You'll lose your appetite. You'll lose. Who cares? Khalas, move on. That's something important. Taghafol. So don't get hang on to everything that you hear from people. So one thing we should try to do is staying positive, brothers and sisters. Second is gratitude. Shukr. Being grateful for the many blessings that we have in this world. Grateful for everything that we have. Alhamdulillah. We have so many things to be grateful for. We just need to remind ourselves. Third is don't hang on, get hung up on every single thing that happens to you, every single experience 
makes it bothers you, bogs you down, brings you, خلاص, move on and go on in your life. These are the third thing. Fourth thing, helping others. Try to help other people. When you help other people, it will make you feel good. People feel good. Some people don't believe in Allah, but they try to do charitable work. You ask them, why do you do all this charity work? He says, it feels good. They like it. It makes them feel good. And that's what some psychologists recommend as well. Helping other people. We have a hadith. Imam Ali alayhi salam says anytime, I'm paraphrasing the hadith, anytime you help someone, a mu'min, especially a mu'min, if you help a mu'min, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you some lotuf. Lotuf means gracious. Some grace, some grace from Allah will come and this grace will be there awaiting anytime you experience a problem, it will come to help you overcome this problem. Yani when you help others, Allah will help you. We have that hadith that says, Irhamu man fil ardi, irhamukum man fil sama. Have mercy on those on earth, Allah will have mercy on you. So help other people. Helping people makes you feel good. When you feel down, go volunteer. Come to the Husayniyyah. Help other people. Give charity. Give sadaqat. These things make you feel good. You'll feel good about it. That's the fourth thing we need to do. Fifth thing. For us believers, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, Ta'atullah, when we obey Allah, it makes us feel good. When we disobey Allah, we don't feel good. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ظَنْكَى Anyone who neglects my commands and following my remembrance, you don't, you know, Allah says, go this way, I go this way. Then they will have a very tight living. They won't feel happy. And we have a hadith about this. A person, al-mu'min, is happy when he obeys Allah, but is unhappy when he disobeys Allah. So why don't we gain our happiness by obeying Allah? My dear brothers, my dear sisters, I mentioned this to some of the sisters today in my talk. Let us dress the way that Allah is pleased with, not the fashion dictates, because culture changes, traditions change. Today they say, okay, you gotta wear tights, you have to wear this, you have to put on this makeup to look beautiful. Okay, tomorrow things might change. Where do we stop? Whereas if we adhere to the teachings of the religion, Allah, it is for our own benefit. You obey me, you will be happy. Obey Allah. I mentioned this story to the sisters today. A friend of mine, he applied for medical school in Canada. Getting into medical school in Canada is very difficult. It's not like in, in, in UK. You have to go through a bachelor's degree, almost a bachelor's degree. And then you have to write an exam called the medical MCAT. Then you have to really go for interviews. You have to have a good GPA. It's really a process to get accepted into medical school in North America. This friend of mine did four years bachelor's. Then he did two years of master's. And then he wrote the MCAT. And then he applied. He got to the stage of the interview. So now he's at the interview process. He goes to the interview. He says, there were five people interviewing me. Three males, two females. I shook hands with the males. When the females came to me, I said to them, I'm, I cannot shake your hands. It's against my religion, but this is how I'm going to greet you. One of those females was upset. You can see her facial expressions. She wasn't too happy. I asked him, I said to him, weren't you worried about getting into medical school? This is your career. You spent six years studying, writing exams, applying until you got to the stage. What if they rejected you? What if they reject you? He says, so what, Sheikh? It is not at the expense of my religion. I'm not going to do something haram. I will not do something haram. If they accept me, great. They don't accept me, then Allah has a better plan for me. Look at the Iman. Two, three months later, he calls me. He says, Sheikh, I received the acceptance letter from the same university. I got in. And now he's, mashallah, practicing physician. 
ينصركم ويثبت أقدامكم. If you support the cause of Allah, Allah will support you. Allah will help you. And even if he didn't get into medical school, he knows Allah has a better plan for me. I will not disobey Allah. He doesn't have to feel with the guilt. A mu'min feels guilty when he disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Feels guilty. I had a person come to me once and says, Shaykh, I am addicted to this particular sin. And he's crying. He says, I know it's haram, Shaykh. It's, very, it's making me feel de terrible. I feel depressed. Because I know it's haram. I told him, why don't you start listening daily to the masaib of Imam al Hussein salam Allah Make a CD. Back in those days, there were CDs. So they make a CD only of masaib of Imam al Hussein. Just masaib. That eulogies at the end of them, the lecture. Every day, listen to it. Two or three years later, I went back to that city to visit. That person comes to me. He says, Sheikh, do you remember me? I said, no, to be honest with you, I don't remember you. He said, I'm the one who had that problem. Do you remember you told me to listen to the Masai? I said, yes, now I remember you. He said, Alhamdulillah, I've overcome my addiction. Khalas. The Masaib of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam helped me overcome these problems. My brothers and sisters, dhikru ahlil bayt, rahmah, ibadah, blessing. When we disobey Allah, if I dress in a way that is not the way the shara orders me to dress. I'm wearing tights. I put on the makeup. I get out. Yes, people might enjoy my fashion. People might enjoy looking at me. But deep inside, I know this is not what Fatima to Zahra wants of me. Am I going to be happy? No, I'm not. Whereas when I dress the way that Fatima alayhi salam is going to be pleased with me, that will make me happy. Yes, I may run through problems in life. I have received some emails from sisters who say, Sheikh, we can, I can't find a job because I wear the abaya. I said to her, be patient, have sabr. Inshallah, Allah will reward you. Allah will give you the ajr. In dunya, you're going to struggle. Same thing with a mu'min. He also struggles. But inshallah, Allah will reward you. And I mentioned today to the sisters, I told them, remember Sayyida Fatima al-Ma'suma, salamullahi alayha. This noble lady, the sister of Imam al-Rida, salamullahi alayha. This noble lady. Fatima al-Ma'suma was about 28 years old when she died and she was not married, which at the time was unheard of. 28-year-old girl, not married in those days, yes. The political situation was so tense that she couldn't get married. So it's okay to strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to struggle in the way of Allah. I remind and I repeat, just like with all the sisters, I'm not saying don't get married. What I'm saying is, if we struggle in this dunya, as long as we are on the path of haqq, that will make us feel happy, tranquility. And that's what we need to do, men and women. Let's not cut corners, play games. No, I'll go on the path of haqq. These are among the things that we can do to make us feel happier, feel better. Positive thinking, gratitude, not holding on to every single detail that happens in our lives, refraining from committing sins, staying positive, always thinking about being strong, having high self-esteem, telling yourself that I am good, I can stay positive. I can succeed. In addition, <coughs> refrain from hanging out with people who are pessimistic. Some people, mashallah, are so depressive. And they depress you with them as well. You sit down and you listen to them. You start crying. Nothing positive to say. Avoid such people. <coughs> Pessimistic people. Stay positive. Hang out. Associate with positive people. The next thing you can do, my dear brothers and dear sisters, attending majalis. Why is attending majalis good? In addition to, of course, the blessings in these majalis, the dhikr of Ahlul Bayt, 
It's the community support. There is a professor at Columbia State University who is a professor of philosophy, and he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God himself. He doesn't believe in God. He wrote a book. Although he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. Yet, he says religion cannot be ignored. He wrote an article saying what religion gives us that science can't. His name is Stephen Asma, A-S-M-A. He's a professor of philosophy. He is not a religious person. However, he says we cannot neglect the fact that religion does provide relief to people, provide support to people. That, he said, we cannot overcome that. We may not agree with religion, he says. We may not find religion rational, according to him, although I disagree with him. The religion of Ahlul Bayt is very rational, very logical, because we can rationally, logically prove there is God. There are prophets, there are imams, there is a day of judgment. And I've done this in the past two years ago when I was here in Muharram. You can refer to these lectures. Some of them I have discussed this at length. So I want to repeat myself here. But it is very logical. According to him, he says, even if we consider religion irrational, I disagree with him. However, he says, even then, we cannot neglect the fact that religion does provide a lot of relief to those who believe in God. And that community support, someone feels down. People come to him. There was a Sayyid in Iran who lived in Germany for many, year, many years. And he achieved a PhD in psychology. His name was a Sayyid al-Bahishti. He got killed. Sayyid Bahishti, when he was in Germany, he says, one day I received a phone call. I was told there is a man in the hospital. He's an old man, but he wants to become a Muslim. This was back well, maybe in the 70s, maybe early 80s, give or take. So we started looking through the phone, phone book. You know, we found Islamic center of so-and-so. So we called. He says, it just so happened I was there. I picked up the phone. They told me, they asked me, can you come to the hospital? Because there is an old man who is German. He wants to become a Muslim. Do you want to come? He says, okay, I'll come. I'll be there. So Sayyid al-Bahishti said, I went to the hospital. Indeed, I saw an old man. German. He wants to become a Muslim. I asked him, what's going on? What is the reason that made you want to become a Muslim when you're so old in the hospital? He says... You know the bed next to me right here? He said, yes. He says, two months ago, a man came into this bed. A person came into this bed next to me in the room. This man, mashallah, every day, 10 people come to visit him. Somebody comes out. Somebody brings flowers and someone brings timan qima. Someone brings whatever. Someone comes. In. Have you seen, mashallah, the Iraqis when someone becomes in the house? Mashallah, you know. They go. Afwajan Afwaja. They say there was a, a man, a scholar, not a Shi'i scholar. His name was a Sha'bi. A Sha'bi. He lived at the time of Bani Umayyah. That's many, many years ago. Sha'bi. Sha'bi becomes ill one day. He becomes ill. He becomes ill. People go to visit. So he couldn't sit straight. You know, he had to slide, lie back like this and stretch his feet. He was ill. His back, he had back pain. Some people came to visit him. So he couldn't stretch his feet, you know, out of respect. So he sat down like this and it was painful to him. It's mustahab when you visit someone who's ill that you don't take too long. Don't sit down, mashallah, chai, gahwa, you know, whatever. Khalas. And he's like, salam alaikum, you're okay. Inshallah, spend a few minutes and get out. These people came and mashallah, they're ha hanging out there. Maybe if they had nargila back then, maybe they were smoking nargila as well with the man, you know. Like we see some of the shabab these days, smoking nargila but forgetting about salat al-layl. And forget Salat al Salat al Fajr altogether, they forget about it. So they sat down. At the end, you know, he found like, khalas, the pain is so. Gets up and picks up his pillow. Pillow. He gets, Shabi, where are you going? He said, Alhamdulillah, Allah cured me. Get out. 
خلاص الحمد لله لقد شفي مريضكم خلاص I become well so this German man says to Sayyid Bahishti this person mashallah people coming people going people one day I asked some of these people I said is this man who's is he a prime minister of a country they said no is he some dignitary is he who is this man he said, no, this is an ordinary person. He's a friend of us. But, you know, he fell sick, so we come here to help him, support him, look after his needs. He says, he's, he's not anyone dignitary. No, he's just an ordinary person. He says, I've been in the hospital for two months. My children have not asked about me. My own children have not looked for me. When I saw this, I told them, what religion is this? They said to the, because they said, this is what our religion mandates. Our religion says we have to provide support to the one who is ill. I asked them, what religion is this? They told me the religion of Islam. So I started thinking about the religion of Islam. And then I requested some books here and there. I started reading. I decided to become a Muslim. I want to become a Muslim. And hence, Sayyid al-Bahishti came and he did the shahada with this old man. He says, a week later, the hospital calls me and says, he died. Subhanallah. One week. Subhanallah. This is tawfiq. Tawfiq. Success. He died. So come and take care of him. His son came then. When the father died, the son came. He said, I want to sell the body of my father. Khalas, I want to sell the body. They told him, no, no, don't sell it. How much do you want to sell it for? He wants to sell it to a local hospital so that they can do, for example, you know, examination, etc. Teaching, they teach with the bodies. He said, how much do you want to sell him for? He says, this much. He says, okay, we'll buy him from you. He want, they bought the body. So he said, okay, خلاص, you do whatever you want with him. We took him, did ghusl, kafan, etc. and we buried him. Subhanallah. So you see, brothers and sisters, Religion provides this comfort, this solitude. Don't live lonely with your pain. Do not live lonely with the pain. Attend majalis, associate with people, but don't be hung up on everything the people say. Oh, why did they say this? Khalas, move on. So that's important. To be part of a group. And that's why I really commend the mu'mineen who've developed some of these foundations. Like I hear today, there is Ruqayya Foundation, there is Al-Akbar Foundation, there is other foundations, Shabab al subtain and many others. Jazakumullah khaira. These help provide venues for the youth so that they can feel that they are part of the community. They feel connected. They don't feel isolated. If the youth feel isolated, they'll start going elsewhere. Billah. God forbid, joining gangs, joining problems, substance abuse. Billah. You want to gain them, provide them with venues, proper training. So this is something important. The last thing I will leave you with about dealing with mental health is talking to someone. Don't keep it all inside. Don't keep it all inside. Talk to people. But Imam Ali alayhi salam, Ahlul Bayt give you criteria. They said, don't talk to anyone. Talk to the will muru'at. Who are the will muru'at? People you can trust, people who fear Allah. Don't trust your friend. Imam Ali says, why not? Because your friend one day can do what? Become your enemy. And when your friend becomes your enemy, what he or she is going to do to all your secrets? Online. This is what this person has done. As we say, shuruk al habil. Have we not seen some friends who turn and they become enemies? Good friends, good close friends. Trust your parents, my dear sisters and my dear brothers. Trust your parents. Because your parents will not expose you. Trust people who fear Allah. People who generate, who have wisdom, demonstrate wisdom. They're wise people. Trust them. And if you can't find anyone, interestingly, one day Jabir ibn Yazid al-Ju'fi, the companion of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he came to him and he said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, you know I've heard so many of your hadith these are heavyweight hadiths. These ones that I cannot talk to people about them. So they really, I mean, I really feel so I need to reveal them to someone, but I can't reveal them to anyone. Imam al-Baqir told him, in that case, go dig a hole and speak to the hole. Now, 
please don't dig holes now in the backyards. You know, you go home and what are you doing? Wallah, Shaykh said to dig holes. And if you don't have a backyard, some of you will go to the plants, you know, like this, you know, the, in your house, and start digging holes. Maybe talk to the mirror. I don't know. Mirror, mirror on the wall. No. And then your father walks in or your mother walks in. What are you doing? Sheikh told me to speak to a mirror. Which Sheikh is this? Usama al Attar. Okay, next time, tell me before you go to Shaykh Usama al Attar, you know. I think he's cuckoo. Yeah. Does he see a psychologist? Yeah. Anyways, but Imam Ali alayhi salam or Imam al Baqir is telling him that fine, you don't have to reveal it to someone. In our cases, I'm not saying talk to the mirror, that was just a joke, or talk to the hole, but reveal it to someone. Don't keep it inside. Some people just need to vent, venting, venting. You listen to them, they feel good. So, but make sure who you speak, you reveal your secrets to. Parents are a good thing. People who fear Allah and they are wise in the community. You can tell who these people are. They demonstrate wisdom. People who do not expose you, don't talk about you. Even if they have a problem with you, they will never expose you because they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes they're known in the community. So and so, this sheikh, that sayyid, this individual, this lady, very wise people. They give you good admonishment. Speak to people. At the end of the day, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, with all these recommendations I just gave, let's turn to Ahlul Bayti alayhim salam. See how much problems they experienced. How many problems they faced. But their Iman in Allah was never shaken. So always believe in Allah. Imam al-Baqir has a very nice hadith for you, Bu'mineen and Mu'minat. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, a believer, a mu'min, should have the conviction Whatever Allah does for him or her, it is for his best. Whether he is cut into pieces, it is for his best. Or he's made the king of this universe, it is for his best. If you believe in this, if you say Allah will help me, then you will be so positive, so grateful. A man came to me a couple years ago when I was here in London. He said, Sheikh, I want to thank you. I said, brother, I don't even know you. He says, no, I'll tell you what my story is. I used to be a pharmacist studying pharmacy at a university that was three hours away from home. Every day I would take the train, three hours going, three hours coming. That's how many hours? Allahumma salli ala, who, who spoke? Man, Allah Say salawat to this man. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. Thank you for staying awake, brother. Jazakallah khair. Maybe. Stay with me, I'm going to watch you. Six hours. He says, at this university, in the second year, when you finish it, you have to write an exam. If you don't pass this exam, you can't move on to third year. And they give you three chances. I wrote the first exam, I didn't pass. Second exam, I did not pass. The third exam, I continued praying to Allah. Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, give me tawfiq. Ya Allah, success, success. I started studying night and day, day and night, etc., etc., etc. I write the final exam. He says, and I really was losing sleep over the stress, the anxiety. The, you know, I, I couldn't sleep. That night when the, uh, the score was about to be revealed, I could not sleep that whole night. And then I listened to your lecture. I said, MashaAllah, Jazakallah khair. When you can't sleep, you listen to me. Thank you very much. It really makes me feel good. Did I put you to sleep? He said, no, Sheikh. You know, uh, I, you know. I listened to your lecture. It just so happened that lecture of yours that I listened to, we're talking about hope, being hopeful. I said, okay, whatever, hopeful. You know. And then the morning came, the scores came out, I failed by two marks. So long for hope, and Sheikh Osama and his hopeful talks. He says, I became depressed, really depressed. I started crying, I felt, my gosh, you know, khalas, my dreams are shattered. I can't move on to the third year. I have to drop out of this university. I started crying. I really got into a mode of de you know, being depressed. I closed the door. I wouldn't eat, etc., etc. After a couple days, my father walks into the room. He says, son, you know, why are you doing this to yourself? He says, father, what am I going to do? I've been studying two years pharmacy. Now it's over. He says, son, why don't you try applying to other universities? Maybe another university will accept you. 
He says, I was really feeling down. But look at the words of encouragement. This time it came from a father. Brothers and sisters, be a source of encouragement to others. A good word is like sadaqah. When you give a good word of encouragement to person. And that's why I go back to that example I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. When you see someone who's a bit overweight, don't tell her, MashaAllah, you've gained weight. Alhamdulillah, nashana shwaya. Don't say it. Khalas. It could be something that he sen she's sensitive about. Or someone, the men, they're very sensitive about their hair sometimes. You look at somebody and say, MashaAllah, look at all this. Oh, Allah salli ala he could be sensitive to this. This is something that he doesn't feel calm. And now he's going to go home feeling depressed. Don't make fun of somebody's looks. You might think that's funny. He may not think it's funny. She may not think it's funny. But look at the other way. Give them encouragement. Try. Don't give up. I will try. Keep on trying. This father to this told this young man, his son, try son, try. Put in the effort. Why don't you look at this university? We have a university in our backyard. Look at them. Maybe they will accept you. So he helped me. My father helped me. We put in the application form and we submitted it. Surely they accepted me. In third year, a university, he says, that is better than the university I was at before. A university that's in our backyard. It literally takes me 20 minutes to get to it. How long did it take him to, take, to go to the other one? Huh? Ahsant. MashaAllah. Three hours every day, six hours going and coming. Six hours. Now it takes me 20 minutes to go. Because of that, I am much more concentrating on my studies. Not only this, I am now participating in the Muslim societies. I am volunteering. I am doing a lot because I have so much more time. I've gained almost five hours on my day that I used to waste on the train. So he said to me, he said, Sheikh, Failing that test was the best thing that happened to me. Wallah, this is what he told me. And he said, I really appreciate your words of hope. Now I really appreciate. I said, yeah, now that you got over your depression, you appreciate my words of hope. You know. So the moral of the story, listen to my words of hope. Boys and girls, before you get into depression, huh? Okay, inshallah. So maybe the next mode of getting out of mental health issues to listen to Osama al-Attaq. You know, that's basically it. Next, being this hopeful individual, when you experience problems, it's okay. That's what Imam al-Baqir says. Don't feel it is the end of the life. In this case, this man, young man, it took him only a few months to realize the greatness of his loss or of his failure. He's not a failure. He's a successful man. And they got accepted in the better university, third year, within two years, he finished. Khalas, now he's practicing as a pharmacist. Finished. Happily ever after. But sometimes it's not so quick. Sometimes it takes 10 years before you realize why was it good for me to lose that job. Sometimes you may not even realize until the akhirah. In the akhirah, Allah will tell you, do you know why you got fired from that position? I'll say, why ya Allah? It really gave me a... Because of the status you have in Jannah. Look at your status now in Jannah. Look at this. When you look at it, you say, my God, I wish I had lost every job I did. But we don't realize it back then. But we need to be convinced Allah loves us. So you see, for example, Zainab, sallamullahi alayha. Is there any greater loss than losing Imam al Hussein sallamullahi alayha? After Rasulullah, after Fatima, she lost Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She lost Fatima sallamullahi alayha at such a young age. She lost Amir al Mu'mineen sallamullahi alayha. She lost Imam al Hassan, sallallahu alayhi And she lost Imam al Hussein. All Ashab al Kisa, she witnessed their losses, one after the other. And then the tents are burnt, children are weeping, her brothers are brutally slaughtered in front of her eyes. Yet, Imam al-Sajjad says, on the day of Ashura at night, the eve of the 11th of Muharram, I see Zainab, salamullahi alayha, my aunt, praying Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl. I tell you this, brothers and sisters. 
When you feel down, pray Salatul Layl. I tried this myself. And last night, one mu'min came to me and said, Sheikh, my sons and I have been trying Salatul Layl for the past two years. After we, I came in Muharram a couple years ago and I spoke about it, he says, we've been trying it. It has changed our lives. My children, I see their akhlaq has changed because of Salatul Layl. Because there is a hadith, when you pray Salatul Layl, it will improve your akhlaq. When you pray Salatul Layl, it will improve your financial situation. When you pray Salatul Layl, it will improve your physical and mental health. We have a hadith about this. Because one of the beauties of Salatul Layl is you stand in the middle of the night and you say, Ilahi, Al-Af, 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 Al-Af. You say, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah, oh, forgive me, Ya Allah, forgive me. And then you start shedding some tears on your cheeks if you can. Out of the greatness of Allah, the fear of Allah, the love of Allah, that will make you feel great. Imam Sajjad said, I saw my aunt Zainab praying to Allah, Salatul Layl. The only difference is she was sitting down, not standing up. So I asked her, my aunt, why are you praying while sitting down? She said, my nephew, ya ibn akhi, I lost my strength. I can't after today. But she did not even forget about not her daily salat, the wajib, Salatul Layl. You feel sometimes down, pray Salatul Layl. Read Ziyarat Ashura. It makes you feel good. For 40 consecutive days. If you can't read all the 100 times Salam and the La'an, fine, just read it once. But 40 consecutive days. Pray it and read it. And read other du'as. Du'as that make you feel good, like Dua Kumail. If Dua Kumail makes you feel good, read Dua Kumail. Dua Tawassul. Read Dua Tawassul. Do tawassul, dhikr of Allah, dhikr of Ahlul Bayt, ala bi dhikr Allahi tatma'innu al-qulub. In the remembrance of Allah, the heart finds peace and tranquility. Then Zainab alayhi salam goes as a prisoner to Kufa. Two maraja' taqlid. They had a student who later he himself also became maraja' taqlid. They were sitting, the three of them together. They asked that student of theirs, why don't you read Masa'ib for us? Eulogies of Ahlul Bayt. That student, he said, I don't know how to read Masa'ib. I don't know, I'm not trained. He said, okay, how about you read them from a textbook? We'll give you a book, you read. He said, okay. They brought him a book, they said, read. He said, I opened the book. Those two marjahs are sitting there. I am reading, at the time he was a student, later he became a marja. I opened the book and I read the first sentence. What is the first sentence? دخلت زينب على ابن زياد. Says Zainab entered before Ibn Ziyad in the court of Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad. He said, the minute I read that sentence, these two maraj'u taqlid, these two great alims, they burst in tears. And they started weeping. Aywa Husayna. They started crying, weeping. I waited for them to calm down so that I can continue. But they continued mourning, crying, weeping. And then one of the two maraj, one of those two ulamas noticed. He turned to me and he said, be patient with us. If you were only to understand the magnitude of the calamity of that sentence. Zainab, the daughter of Amir al muminin the daughter of the house of purity and impeccability and infallibility. A lady whose her whole life she's treated as a princess by her brothers. Now she becomes a prisoner and enters the court of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And then Ubaidullah comes to ask her, Ma ra'ayti aw kayfa ra'ayti sun Allah fiki wa fi ahli baytik? How do you see what Allah did to you and to your family members? What do you think about that? She looks at him with all her strength. 
the strength of Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه, and she says Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. anything that comes from Allah is beautiful but it is you who killed my family Ibn Ziyad you are the one who brought me here you look at this nobility look at that positive feeling positive thinking that love of Allah that Iman this is what we need to learn of Zainab one of the things we need to learn of her is her love to Allah her patience her strength and implemented in our lives and then she goes into her journey from Karbala to Kufa, Kufa to Sham. As she enters Sham, she sees how the situation is. When she was in Kufa, she remembered the day when she entered with her father, Amir al Mu'minin, salam Allahi alayhi. One day, after the burial of a Sayyida Zahra, Salamullahi Alayha. Sayyida Zahra, in her will to Imam Ali, asked him, she said, Ya Ali, waqra il Quran ala qabri, fa in al mayyita yana subiqira at il Quran. Read the Quran over my qabr, because the mayyit enjoys the recitation of the Quran. So sometimes in the middle of the night when nobody's around, no one is watching, Imam Ali would go in hiding to the qabr of a Sayyid al zahra and recites the Quran. One night, his eyes snoozed. He saw a Sayyid al zahra alayhi salam. She said to him, Ya Ali, get back to the house now. He says, Ya Mawlati, Sometimes he used to call her Ya Mawlati or Ya Sayyidati, sometimes. Although he is her Imam, but that's, he knows her reverence before Allah. He says, Ya Mawlati, I am here with you. Let me stay with you. Away from this dunya, the pain of this dunya. She said, Ya Ali, but Zainab, my five-year-old daughter, has just woken up in her the house and she is calling she's crying she's saying aywa aliya aywa abata go back to her calm her down comfort her amir al mu'minin salamullah alayhi gets up rushes back to the house as he enters he finds zainab salamullah alayha crying Aywa abataya ya aywa ya aliya Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam comes to her the little girl five years old just lost her mother Fatima salam Allahi alayha he comes, he hugs a Sayyida Zainab salam Allahi alayha he kisses her he comforts her he says, my little, my little girl, girl, girl. What, what happened? happened? Uh, she, she said, said, oh father, ya amir al-mu'mini. I woke up in the middle of the night. I remembered my mother Fatima. Ah, Zainab, yes, my little girl. 
Then what happened? I miss my mother, Fatima. I know she's no longer here with us. So I started calling you. I started crying. Aywa Abata, Aywa Aliya. But I don't see you, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. I didn't hear you, my father. Imam Ali cried. He said, My little girl, here I am. I'm here with you. I did not leave you. I will be there for you. I say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, where were you on the day of Ashura? When Zainab saw the head of Imam al Hussein on the spears of Bani Umayyah, and she cried, Aywa Aliya. Aywa Abataya. Where were you on that day when Zainab cried? Oh, Father, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, come and see your son Hussein on the plains of Karbala under the horses of Bani Umayyah. And the head of Hussein on the spears of Bani Umayyah. Ah, ya, ya. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, where were you on the day when Zainab returned to Medina and saw Umm al Bani? When she told her, Ya Umm al Bani, Abbas's right hand got cut off in Karbala, his left hand got cut off in Karbala. His eye was shot with an arrow in Karbala. Ya Umm al Bani, Ya Umm al Bani. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, where were you? When Umm al Bani, we used to go to the cemetery of Baqi. She made four graves representing those of her sons, and a fifth one representing that of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. She lived for about three years after Karbala. Imagine Umm al Bani three years. After Karbala, every day she would go to the Qabr of Baqi' cemetery of Baqi' She sits there and she cries, La tad'uwanni, wayki umm al-banin, umm al-banin, tudhakkirini biliyuth al-ari. Do not call me Umm al-Baneen anymore. I have lost all my sons. Kanat banoon aliyya ud'a bim. Wal yawma asbahtu ala min baneen. Hatta taqool ya layta shi'ri akama akhbaru. Bi anna Abbas al-Qati'u al-Yameen. Inna lillah. وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. This is the last day of the مجلس. This مجلس. إن شاء الله the حاجات are fulfilled tonight with the بركة of أم البنين. These eyes that you have shed the tears with on this noble lady and her children and her family and the family of أهل البيت عليهم السلام. The hajat are all accepted. Everyone raise your hands. Inshallah, this is the time when the hajat will be fulfilled. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Together, everyone, because when we pray collectively, Allah, inshallah, answers the dua. 
أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times together يا الله everyone يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله إلهي بباب الحوائج أم البنين اجعلنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة الزهراء المتقين يا الله وخدمة الإمام الحسين المخلصين يا الله وارزقنا شفاعتهم في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شاف وعاف جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات اكشف هذه الخم عن هذه الأمة اللهم ومن أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اقض حوائجهم شاف مرضاهم احفظهم في أنفسهم وأوطانهم وديارهم وذويهم وأهليهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعتي وأنصاري وأعواني والمستشهدين بين يديه together let's recite this dua may Allah through his mercy send our imam to this majlis inshallah to see us and record all of our names as his companions together inshallah Allahumma kun li wali كان حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك وعلى أبا في هذه هو في كل وليا هو قائدا ودليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لقضاء الحوائج لشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح أمواتنا وأموات الجالسين والحاضرين والباذلين والمساهمين والمؤسسين والشهداء والعلماء رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات